Chapter 8, Lifespan Development. So with this chapter, it's difficult to truly understand the in-depth components of, of the unique needs that each one of these different uh, patient demographics require. We all remember vaguely things from when we were kids. Uh, we have an idea of what life will be like for us when we get older. And a lot of these are based on, on observations or, or faint memories that uh, really aren't that vivid anymore. So as care providers, the best thing we can do is, is look at all of our different patients, the different sizes, the different ages, and, and really think practically about what it is that this patient needs. How do I need to customize my treatment plan in order to be most effective for these patients? And really, I didn't begin to understand a lot of this stuff until I became a father. For one reason, you know, until you're a father or a parent as, as a whole, you don't really understand what these kids' needs are. You know, looking at this this little infant here, there is so much going on as far as, as reading the patient, um, understanding you know, what their normal mental status is, what their standard behaviors are, how to identify when something's wrong and when something isn't. And it's not something that can be taught. You know, even I, I can tell you everything you need to know about my children. But if I go and I provide care for another infant like this, I'll have a general understanding. But I also know that, you know, that other infant is different than how my kids were when they were young. And so really the best resource for these young ones are going to be the parents, the ones that are caring for these kids day in and day out, know the ins and outs, know the, the special quirks, and can tell you explicitly, yes, my, my son or daughter is acting appropriately. No, they're not acting right because there's no way for us to assess these patients and get feedback directly from them. You know, obviously, if I'm concerned about a potential head injury from this little baby, I can't ask something like a headache. You know, I, I can't ask them other questions and get that feedback. I can't determine if they're alert and oriented times four. So I have to look at just general behaviors and, and some other indicators. So anyways, this is our infancy stage, birth to one year. We can actually divide infancy down into several other stages, including newborn and neonate. And we'll get more specific when we get into the childbirth chapter. Uh, but for today, what we're looking at, an infant constitutes anywhere from birth to one year old. Physiological uh, signs or, or considerations for an infant is what you see on the slide here. Average birth weight is, is at seven pounds, give or take. Uh, we can certainly have some babies that go up north of 10 pounds. And then we have premature babies that are are born well under seven pounds down into the, the four or five pound range. What you're gonna have to take into consideration here is that we do everything in, in kilograms. So for EMS purposes, when we're looking at different medical devices, when we're dosing our uh, medications out, everything is done in kilograms. So start working on that conversion, 2.2 pounds for every kilogram. Now the second bullet point here says that the weight doubles by six months and triples by 12. And that's simply a benchmark. When we would take the, the kids into the doctor for their, their checkups, uh, right after birth, you know, you go within a week, and then you go a couple weeks, and then it's a couple months, and then now we're up to once a year. Uh, but when we do those checkups, the doctor always plots their head size and weight and height on these growth charts. And then we look at where our kids are in comparison to what the averages are. And I'll tell you what, uh, you know, to even use the term average is, is questionable. There's a, a huge range in what would be considered normal. Some kids grow fast, some kids grow slow, um, and at the end of the day, there, there is just no determining this is exactly where the kid should be, so something is, is off if they're not. Um, we have to look at the kid, we have to use gut instincts, and again, I'll say it, utilize the, the best resource possible, which is going to be mom or dad, or other family member or caregiver. Uh, had 25% of their total body weight. So what that tells us is if their head represents a quarter of the overall body weight, um, if they are to fall, especially uh, if, if they were to roll off a couch in infancy, or even when they get up to the toddler stages and they're walking, when they fall, that head is very heavy and it tends to pull them down first. Therefore, they uh, tend to have a lot of head injuries. Um, maybe not real severe because they're not jumping from high, high surfaces, uh, but nonetheless, they fall and bonk their head quite often. Uh, in the anatomy chapter, we talked quite a bit about airway differences in kids versus adults. Uh, these little babies have a narrow, narrow uh, trachea. It's not much different than that of a coffee straw, right? Theirs is probably just slightly larger than that, but it's very flexible. 
it kinks off very easy. Uh, we need to maintain neutral alignments. There's, there's so many uh, little nuances about dealing with these kids. So the chapter refers to a lot of additional information along with my Brady Lab. Make sure that you're going through it. You know, at the end of the day, these, these kids, these babies, um, they're intimidating to us because we don't deal with them on a regular basis. And because of that, we're not competent, we're not uh, uh, proficient. So we need to really take extra time to, to read up on it, to practice our skills with these kids, and just to think critically about how we're going to handle different situations. Uh, down here, nose and diaphragm used for breathing. Babies are nose breathers. I'm going to say that again. Babies are nose breathers. And one more time, babies are nose breathers. Why do I emphasize that? Probably because it's important and because it's going to be on an exam. If you have a, a hard time remembering, well, how do babies breathe? Do they breathe through their nose or through their mouth? Just picture a, a kid that's uh, taking a bottle or nursing. They never stop and come up for air, right? Uh, when a, a kid's nursing, they get latched on there, and they may nurse for a half hour, sometimes even longer than that. And as they're nursing, they never release that, that uh, suction on the nipple. What they do is they'll stop sucking for a, a quick second and they'll breathe through their nose as they're eating. So that's a good way to remember that they've always got the mouth kind of locked on and all their respiratory effort goes through their nose at that point. What's the significance in that? Well, what happens to little tiny babies when they get sick all the time? Their nose gets stuffed up and we're working on maintaining that airway. So something as simple as a stuffy nose uh, can really begin to impact a kid's respiratory efforts. And for these little babies, oxygen is everything. For adults, oxygen is important. We need it to survive. Um, but we can go short periods of time, you know, with an oxygen depleted environment. Uh, we can kind of compensate. But these kids, that's not the case at all. Uh, as soon as their oxygen levels begin to drop, we start to see some significant changes in their overall uh, cardiac output. And uh, death could be pretty, pretty quick uh, behind any respiratory issues here. So some physiological things here, antibodies pass from mother to child in pregnancy. Obviously, these kids don't have much in the way of an immune system because they haven't been exposed to much. So these children rely on mom, not only through pregnancy, but also through breastfeeding to provide all the nutrients and antibodies that they need to try to fight off infection and disease. A few different things that we can look at to determine the kid's mental status, right? Again, I can't say, do you know where you are today? What is today? Uh, none of those questions are going to be applicable. So I have to look at basic neurologic function through the eyes of uh, or through the assessment of different reflexes. Now the first one listed, the moral reflex, um, it, every time a, a baby gets startled, their natural response is to kind of flare their entire body out. Uh, however, I don't encourage you to walk around trying to scare the crap out of little babies to assess their, their overall cognitive function. That's not going to be great in the way of public relations. Uh, looking at the palmar reflex, though, is you simply lay your finger into the palm of a baby's hand. The natural response should be for the fingers to kind of clamp down and for them to grab your finger. That's a great way to evaluate cognitive function. The rooting reflex, then, which is hunger, um, every time you rub their cheek, so if you just kind of gently uh, massage the side of their cheek, they should naturally turn in that direction. And that's actually how a mom will and get the baby to look at her uh, when she's getting ready to nurse. So she can take the nipple, just kind of brush the, the side of the cheek, and the baby naturally looks in that direction to begin feeding. The sucking reflex then, so as soon as the lips are, are stroked, the, the child begins or the baby begins to, to suck on it. The same thing applies with, with, with the example I just used with nursing. You can use your, your uh, index finger or your pinky finger even, and just kind of see if the baby tries to latch on. Uh, as long as they make the attempt, those are good natural responses. Their sleep patterns, <laughs> uh, this is kind of funny, says begins to regulate after two to four months. Um, we'll, uh, we'll say that's a subjective statement, and I'm sure there's plenty of parents that would have uh, other opinions on that. Uh, some babies sleep great, some don't sleep great at all. Um, it, it just depends. Sleep patterns are something that we're not going to think a whole lot about from our perspective, other than we might say, hey, you know, has the baby been sleeping normally? Um, because if the parent can tell us that the baby has a great sleep schedule, and all of a sudden they started sleeping, you know, they're, they're waking up all the time, they're crying, 
you know, those could be just little indicators that there's something wrong. But it's not going to clue us into anything that we need to specifically identify or treat. All right. Fontanelles. So I'm sure you've heard of soft spots on babies. And I remember um, I was four years old and six years old when my mom had my brothers. And I, for whatever reason today, specifically remember sitting on the couch, getting to hold my, my baby brother for the first time. I was four years old. And my mom's scaring the crap out of me, telling me that the baby has a soft spot. And if I touch the soft spot, it could hurt the baby really bad. And, and to this day, that's something that really uh, remains ingrained in me. Although what I do know is that although those soft spots are delicate and do have the risk for injury, uh, they're not quite as fragile as my mom uh, explained to a four-year-old uh, four at the time. But uh, nonetheless, the fontanelles, it's an area of cartilage that just hasn't hardened up yet. Um, when the baby is born and the reason is is they need the, the cranium to actually be somewhat pliable for the the plates to almost shift a little bit to accommodate the birthing process after the child is born those fontanelles begin to harden up as the cartilage hardens um, the good thing that we can utilize those fontanelles for prior to them closing up is to assess the presence of pot potential intracranial pressure or even dehydration so those uh, the anterior and posterior, which are right on top of the skull, um, if the baby has a high temperature and they're febrile, suggesting something like meningitis, for instance, um, that meningitis can build up pressure within the cranium, and we'll actually start to see those fontanelles begin to bulge. Conversely, uh, if the child, and this is going to be more common than anything else, if the child is dehydrated, then we'll start to see those fontanelles sink in a little bit. And we can take, you know, that that suggestion or, or that observation coupled with other things to determine the possibility of dehydration. And if you think back to Chapter 7, we talked about how hydration status is really important to the function of life. Oh, there you go. Sunken fontanelles is dehydration. Bulging fontanelles increase pressure within the skull. Psychosocial. Uh, not a lot that we really need to... Uh, concern ourselves with when it comes to the psychosocial component of infancy. Uh, obviously at this point in time the child is beginning to develop a bond uh, most particularly with mom especially if mom is nursing um, but uh, uh, we should be able to interact with these kids relatively well. Granted you know there's there's going to be things you know a certain way that the child likes to be held a certain way the child likes to be rocked in order to kind of calm the kid in stressful circumstances but overall we should be able to interact and, and treat these patients without them you know fighting back too much and generally speaking you know as these kids continue to develop and they develop pretty substantially over the course of the first year you'll see them you know building on, on one building on things that they already know that's what scaffolding is uh, you'll see changes in their temperament but again, from a, a pre-hospital EMS perspective, these are things that, unless they're going to clue us in specifically to an underlying condition that needs to be treated, uh, is really beyond our scope of, uh, of concern. So the toddler phase, ages 12 to 36 months, uh, included within this are the terrible twos. I can tell you that the terrible twos may start earlier than two, may last longer than two, um, may last their entire life to some point. Not that I'm know from experience or anything um, but nonetheless so the toddler phase 12 to 36 months cute little kid there right um, these kids develop an incredible uh, amount over the course of this this period um, I can tell you that my uh, first son uh, started walking a little after one year my second son started walking at seven months by the time he was a year old he was climbing a ladder uh, so if that just kind of clues you into kind of the rates of development and, and how it differs um, also, how their environment impacts things. Um, you know, second, third, fourth children, they see what their older siblings are doing and they strive to keep up. So they tend to develop a little bit faster. Um, in addition to this, you know, between 12 and 36 months, these kids go from maybe saying just a couple words, if talking at all, um, all the way up to talking full sentences uh, to the point that they, they never shut up. Um, these kids learn not only to walk, but now they know how to run, they know how to climb. Um, I mean, there's just an incredible amount of development at the toddler phase. What makes that difficult is to simply say that a, a toddler should be assessed in one specific way would be, uh, would be impractical. 
we have to customize our treatment, we have to customize our assessments based on the developmental uh, stages of each patient that we come across. So we have to do some assessments on how, how far along are they. You know, and then again, we utilize mom or dad or other people to, to indicate that, you know, how much is the kid talking? Uh, can the kid, you know, walk? And we want to identify where they typically are on a normal day, compare that to how they're responding during the time that we're evaluating them, and look for clues that could suggest that something is going on or something could be treated. So a lot of development here within the, the physiological realm. Within the pulmonary system, more and more bronchioles are developing, additional al alveoli are developing, allowing for uh, faster uh, gas exchange as the oxygen demand of these kids begins to increase as their body and activity levels grow. Um, within the brain, the brain is substantially larger. It's actually reaching 90% of the overall brain weight of an adult. Um, their brain is firing at an incredible rate at this point. They are observing everything around them. They're learning. Um, they're developing new, school, uh, new skills. Pretty, pretty cool. Now, musculoskeletal, that's really worth mentioning here. Uh, with going back to infants, right, their bones are still relatively soft. They're flexible. Um, a lot of the um, components that harden the bones hasn't occurred yet for those infants. And we need to consider that when we're assessing trauma. Uh, also, while we're looking for signs of potential abuse. Small infants should not have much in the way of broken bones. Uh, it takes a lot of force to break a bone because of just how, how pliable they are. The same applies within the toddler phase, but we do begin to see some hardening of these, these bones. The, the bone density itself begins to increase. And as that occurs, we have to use that as a, as a discriminatory factor. Hey, did this kid really fall off a slide or fall off a bed uh, to cause this deformity? Or could there potentially be an underlying cause of abuse here? So all things that we need to really think about. Psychosocial then, these kids are super difficult to work with. Um, even, even as a, a father, my kids, you know, they tend to bond with my wife at this age. Um, she was a stay-at-home mom during these times, and, you know, she was their comfort zone. She was what they knew every time they got hurt, every time they got hungry, every time they needed anything, mommy was there to provide for them. So that bond was incredibly strong. Um, and still to this day, uh, with my four-year-old, you know, if he falls down and gets hurt, if I'm the only one around, fine, I'll do. But generally speaking, if it's a choice between mommy or daddy, he runs straight to mommy because mommy, for whatever reason, can just comfort him a little bit better. So along with that, the separation anxiety, you know, if as a care provider, we try to take the kid away from mom or dad and, and provide treatment, uh, there's a good chance that they're going to lose it. They're going to freak out. They don't want to be separated. They need that comfort zone. Um, so in the back of the ambulance, we should have mom or dad. And don't be afraid to ask, hey, which one of you is going to be most effective at comforting the child? And it's not always going to be mom, uh, but in a lot of cases, it probably will be. Have mom in the back of the ambulance. Have mom holding the kid. There's no reason you can't do an assessment or provide basic treatments while the child is in mom's lab. This magic thinking, imagination, uh, play acting. While that, that's great, it's a, a integral part of the psychological development of a kid, it can make it somewhat difficult for us to perform assessments. And, uh, you know, as we go to ask questions, you know, at the age of 12, the kid may not understand, or 12 months, they may not understand and, and respond appropriately. But as we get up to the three-year mark, yeah, we should be able to ask, you know, where does it hurt? How, what happened? Um, you know, where did you fall from? Those types of things. Uh, but we have to look for inconsistencies in the story and just try to identify, you know, is this kid telling us truly a story or is he providing uh, facts? All right, so moving on to preschool then, ages three to five years. Um, these kids, and I've got, uh, again, a four-year-old and a six-year-old as, as this discussion is recorded. Um, you know, these kids are cute as a button. They're very, very active. Um, I frankly, I love this stage, but it does come with a, a couple different things that we have to consider. While there isn't uh, an incredible amount of, of change that occurs here, it's just kind of a, a slow and continual development. Um, one thing to keep in mind 
is that at the age of you know three to five years, these kids are starting preschool. Uh, they're starting to interact more with peers of the, the, the same age, and they have their eyes and ears open to everything. Um, they are, are constantly with their head on the swivel, what's going on around them, observing their environment, and believe it or not, they're very susceptible to peer pressure at this point. What these kids see other people do, they're going to try to mimic. Um, and they have a hard time understanding the differences between right and wrong here. This is a, an integral phase of life where we spend a lot of time teaching right and wrong. Uh, but as they uh, only slowly develop those, those decision-making skills and the ability to identify right and wrong, uh, we see them doing things that they otherwise shouldn't. Um, case in point, uh, just a couple, well, at the beginning of the summer, my six-year-old finally shed his training wheels and started riding his bike without them. My four-year-old saw that and decided he wanted to do the same thing. Now, I spent some time arguing, no, you don't need to take them off yet. You know, wait till you're older like your brother. And he was persistent. And I took him off, and within five minutes, he was riding without training wheels. Uh, again, it speaks to the developmental differences between the, the two kids. Uh, not that one was slower, uh, the other one is accelerated, but they're just simply different. Um, and in this case here, as these younger kids see older kids doing things, they want to do the same. So I guess the, the point of that is that the, the peer pressure is substantial for these preschool age kids, uh, not necessarily to do drugs or things like that that we think about with peer pressure, but just simply to mimic what they see otherwise. Um, and that's an important concept to remember for the upcoming exam. All right, moving on, school age kids, 6 to 12. There's a lot of change here. There's a wide variety of things that occur at, at the school age uh, here. And you, as you can see, 6 to 12 years is a pretty substantial range. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we may start to see. Like, uh, loss of primary teeth. So their baby teeth start to uh, fall out. And although that doesn't really pose much of a, a concern to us, we would have to evaluate any airway interferences or something like that that we may have to accommodate. Uh, the psychosocial. So they become less supervised. Uh, they become more independent, one, because they want to be independent, two, because they can be trusted uh, a little bit more. You know, I don't have to keep a constant eye on my six-year-old. Um, I can work in my office while he plays upstairs on the Nintendo, and I could probably check on him every 45 minutes or an hour, and everything would just be fine. Um, they're developing those decision-making skills. Uh, parents have to be very, very aggressive in teaching at this age, uh, explaining to them, again, those differences between right and wrong. Generally, they know it, um, but there's still a lot of guidance that's required here. They're more aware of their self-esteem, and this is something that uh, is extremely difficult. So um, when it comes to self-esteem, when it comes to overall confidence levels, as parents, we have to be uh, very aware of the examples that we're setting and also the things that we say to the kids. And I, I didn't realize just how quickly this would set in, but uh, um, my six-year-old has something called molluscum contagiosum. And uh, essentially what it is, they're little tiny warts that develop on the skin. Um, it's a, a contagious thing. He probably got it in school. Uh, they look like little pimples and they can develop throughout the entire body. And then eventually they just go away. It's a virus, um, can't necessarily be treated, and you just have to kind of run its course. Very, very common um, from the research we've done and talking to the doctors. Uh, well over 50% of kids will develop this at some point in time, and all the bodies just kind of react differently as far as uh, how wide how widespread it becomes. Uh, my four-year-old also got it, probably from his brother. And, uh, you know, his outbreak is, is far less severe than, than the older ones. Um, but it got to the point that even on hot days, my six-year-old just didn't want to wear shorts. And, you know, he, he can go and get his own clothes, dress himself. And I'd say, you know, it, it's going to be hot today, bud. Don't you want to put shorts on? And it was always no. It was long pants and, and long sleeve shirt. And eventually I, I sat him down and I said, hey, you are going to be sweating. Why are you wearing this? What's going on? And finally, he told me it's because he was embarrassed of his warts and he didn't want anybody to see it. Now, this was over the summer. It's not like he was going to school. This was just running around outside in the yard, a couple neighbor friends, that's it. And uh, he broke down in tears. He was embarrassed. Um, he didn't want anybody to see this. 
And, uh, you know, it's something that we really had to work with him on. And we had to explain to him, hey, everybody gets it. And quite frankly, even the neighbor girl has it. I said, everybody gets it. Everybody is going to deal with it. Nobody's going to make fun of you. Nobody's going to um, to say anything bad about you. And, and we just really had to reinforce this positivity. Um, and we can expect that same thing to apply with uh, EMS intervention. So as we're trying to talk to these kids, they may be embarrassed about what happened. Uh, they may be hesitant to show you what happened. Um, or they may even kind of tweak the story as to what happened in order to avoid you know, getting in trouble for anything. Where this also applies is as these kids are going to school, uh, not only in school, but at home, we're starting to talk about things like stranger danger. We're talking about uh, private parts and, and who's allowed to see and, and touch and who isn't. And, you know, as far as the kids are concerned, although, yes, police officers and firefighters and paramedics are supposed to be good people to help, uh, to them, they're still strangers. And if we need to assess the kid, uh, especially if we need to perform an assessment on any sensitive parts of the body, um, they may be very reluctant to expose themselves or let us look. You know, for us as adults and their kids, we're, we're just doing our job. Nobody really thinks much of it. You know, I can walk up to a, an adult female and tell her that I need to do an EKG and expose her breasts, and it's probably not the end of the world because there's this general understanding that it's a professional environment. However, if I walk up to a six or seven year old girl and I tell her that I need to expose something to, to perform an assessment, there's gonna be a lot more apprehension there. And as there should be, uh, we wanna make sure that these kids understand that there's only certain people that should be able to see them or touch them, and they should have this area of privacy um, and, and you know understand that as a whole. So what are some of the solutions? Again, have mom or dad present. Mom or dad could actually help you with the assessment. They can, um, you know, tell the child it's okay. You know, you can let them do it. You know, nobody else, but uh, just have them be a part of the assessment uh, process there. Adolescents. This is my least favorite age group. Uh, they're no longer cute anymore. Now they're just jerks. Um, and as they reach this age, not only do they have the higher level of independence, but now there's also, um, you know, a lot of, we run into the potential for, for drug use, alcohol use, um, the self-esteem issues become really bad as, as we deal with um, bouts of depression, possibly eating disorders. Um, because of the hormonal changes that occur at the adolescent stage here, um, it's, it's just a really, really tough time for them, both physically as their body changes and mentally as they start to expand uh, their general understanding of life. So we see a rapid two to three year growth spurt, um, even to the point that uh, uh, stretch marks can occur on some kids because they grow so quickly. The sexual maturity, obviously with the sexual maturity also comes sexual curiosity. Um, just the amount of, of emotional pressure on these kids is, is incredible. Um, so we need to do a couple things. From a legal standpoint, we know that anybody under the age of 18 is considered a minor, and mom or dad have to make decisions on their behalf. But that doesn't mean that we should discredit the opinions or wishes of these kids. You know, if I walk up to a 16-year-old, I should ask them, you know, what is it that you want? Do you want to go to the hospital? Do you not want to go to the hospital? Um, do you want to be treated? Do you not want to be treated? They should have choices in their life. Now, at the end of the day, their decisions need to be supported by mom and dad. If mom and dad overrule them, unless there's some underlying cause or some underlying issue that I need to address, mom and dad's decision is going to rule. Um, but that doesn't mean, again, that I just simply ignore these kids. I need to talk to them. I need to treat them as adults. I need to show them respect. And in return, hopefully, they will do the same for us. So here, talking about striving for independence, and, and not just simply striving, but developing a lot of independence, especially once that driver's license comes, right? Out on the road, kind of doing their own thing, um, and very capable. They're starting to get jobs at this point. Um, they're going out with their friends unattended. You know, they're maturing. They're growing up a lot, and uh, we need to respect that independence level. Their body image and peer pressure can play into things. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, reiterate, though, for the exam, 
the demographic that is most susceptible to peer pressure is going to be that preschool age group. Okay, that is one of the exam questions. Uh, destructive behaviors, we're starting to see a lot of that. Uh, cutting, burning, just general body mutilations. Um, and it's, uh, uh, I'll tell you, I, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know that kids today are substantially different from, you know, 30 years ago. What I do know, though, is that the fragile emotional state in today's day and age has caused a lot more kids to, um, we'll say, be comfortable with expressing their their emotional distresses outwardly. And a lot of times that comes in the form of physical mutilations. You know, we're seeing more and more cuts to the wrists, not necessarily suicide attempts, but simply um, horizontal cuts that maybe it's a call for help, maybe it's a, a sensory thing, maybe it's therapeutic, whatever the underlying cause is, uh, we're starting to see this stuff more often. So we're doing a lot in the way of psychological evaluations uh, on this demographic. Uh, we're transporting a lot more of them to crisis for discussions and, and further help. Um, it, it's just, again, it's a really, really difficult age group. Um, yeah, this is great. Adolescents are often injured during uh, risk-taking or because of risk-taking. Um, and picture a 16-year-old boy showing off for a bunch of 16-year-old girls, right? Hey, watch how I can jump off the roof of this house. Watch how I can, you know, do this with my skateboard, you know, whatever the case is. Um, and because we tend to take additional risks, um, there's that potential risk for injury. I'll give you one personal example of one of the uh, the countless stupid things I did growing up. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, I should either be dead or in prison right now. I'm not sure why I'm neither one of those, but uh, uh, thinking back on it, <laughs> I probably got lucky. Um, we were at a high school party, uh, probably uh, utilizing some, uh, some illegal substances at the time, and we decided it would be a good idea to jump off the second story roof of my friend's house into their in-ground pool. Now, lots of people around to impress, so we climbed up there. Um, I, one person went and, and did just fine. Um, I went and I didn't jump quite as far, and I remember that as I entered the water, uh, my butt slid down the, the slope of the pool, going from the shallow end into the deep end. And I was fine, uninjured, uh, but imagine if I landed a couple feet shorter, uh, to the point that I actually, you know, hit that that level shallow end. That could have been pretty pretty disastrous. But the next person was even worse. They ran, they jumped, and they tripped on the gutter. Now they made it into the pool, but just barely. They were probably about a foot from death. Um, and fortunately, I, I think that was a, a big enough indicator to us that okay, this was a stupid idea. Let's not do it anymore. But not before three three people tried. Uh, and at the end of the day, all three of us probably narrowly escaped uh, being significantly injured or killed. So uh, we can run into some pretty catastrophic injuries, even with car accidents at this age group. These kids are, are driving fast, they're inexperienced, they're easily distracted. We see some pretty bad accidents with these kids. Early adulthood, ages 19 to 40. Uh, this currently describes me. Uh, I'm a ripe 19 years old. No, I wish. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm I'm approaching the end of this um, this reign, and I'll tell you what. Looking back, I I'm actually kind of surprised that early adulthood is even grouped uh, together in this this wide range of 19 to 40. Because who I was and what I dealt with at the ages of 19 and 20 compared to where I am today in life entirely different. We go from young kids living at home with mom and dad, uh, very few responsibilities to you know, not only making our way through college, but now we have jobs, we got married, we've got kids, we have a, we have a mortgage to pay. There's just a lot that goes on here. Um, so from a physiological standpoint, we begin to form lifelong habits, um, hopefully some better than, than others. Um, the peak physical conditioning uh, maxes out really in the early 20s. I, I think for a male, peak physical conditioning is actually at the age of like 26. And then for a female, I believe it's 22 to 24. But once the, the peak process has been reached, or the peak condition has been reached, uh, the body itself starts to slow down quite a bit. 
Uh, and I can tell you that uh, when I hit 30 and every year thereafter, I can feel a substantial slowdown. Psychosocial, job and family stress. Um, I think about every day, you know, what is it that I can do to provide for my family? Uh, if there's a stress in life, uh, it's related to how it is that I can um, raise my children, how I can be a better husband, how I can uh, make sure that my family has everything that they need. Those are where the stresses for me come from. Uh, so when we're dealing with, let's say, um, you know, an evaluation for a suicidal individual, uh, if it's a, uh, an adult in this range, and it doesn't always have to be the male, right? Uh, breadwinners, providers could be um, husband or wife. Uh, I, they could be anybody within the relationship, right? But I can tell you at this age group, as we're dealing with the, the crisis type stuff, um, you know, it, it's going to be hard to overcome. It's going to be hard for us to kind of talk them through this. One, we're not properly trained to do psychological intervention, right? But two, um, you know, depending on how old you are and what your personal experiences are, as a young EMT coming out of school, maybe 20 years old, 21, 22, um, you just don't have these experiences, and it's going to be difficult to relate. And we need to be really aware of that, especially as we're working through these, these crisis calls. Um, we never want to tell anybody that we know how they feel. We never want to say, you know, oh, yeah, I, I get it, uh, because we probably don't. Um, it's good to be listeners here, and it's important that we just simply reinforce the concept that, hey, we just want to, you know, make sure everything's okay. We just want to help. Um, we want to get you to talk to somebody who's able to, you know, provide some, some more help than what we can provide. So the middle adulthood, 41 to 60 years old, um, here the body is really starting to slow down. Uh, we're starting to see far more chronic diseases, long-term hypertension, diabetes is starting to set in, uh, cancers, uh, heart disease is becoming a problem. Uh, there's a, just a lot going on. Weight control becomes more difficult. Uh, not only do we live in America, the land of fast food and, and GMOs and all this other garbage that's in our food, but now, you know, these, these people, they're working in their careers. They have been for years. Um, maybe they're working a desk job. Uh, generally, their metabolic rate starts to slow down, so they're not burning as many calories as they were in the past. Um, just a lot of health conditions that set in that become difficult. From a psychosocial perspective, empty nest syndrome. Uh, as the kids begin to lose or leave the house, uh, mom and dad are now left at home. You know, the house is empty. Um, from an emotional standpoint, things change quite a bit. Although I don't think that applied to my parents because when my brothers and I moved out, uh, they upgraded, they got a larger home, and they started spending all this money. So um, obviously they seem to cope with it just fine. Uh, but we do start running into the, the component of caring for elderly parents. Um, you figure somebody that's 60 years old, assuming mom or dad could potentially be in their 80s uh, or even 90s at that point, we kind of shift from dealing with our kids to now going back to deal with our parents. So there's a transitional phase there. Late adulthood, 61 years and older. You know, these people having a great time. They're enjoying life. And generally, I think that's probably common, right? That's where we've kind of figured life out finally. Maybe we're into retirement. We don't have to work any longer but our bodies are certainly slowing down. Uh, nothing is working as well as it should have been. All of these medical conditions that maybe we've had for a while now, they're beginning to compound on top of new medical conditions. Um, and as we approach late into the elderly stages, um, obviously financial burdens as we're no longer working, how much money do we have left? How is social security providing for us? Uh, what about health care? We begin thinking about things like death and dying. So. Uh, there's a, a psychological component that really transitions there. Um, you know, some people I've I've had them tell me that you know those early retirement years are were the best years of their life, and then obviously our elderly patients, you know, they may argue that they enjoyed life a little bit more when they were younger. So um, just kind of adapting, getting a feel for our patients' uh, current. All right, and that summarizes. Chapter 8. If you guys have any questions, reach out to one of your instructors. We'll